All right, today we are going to take a look at a very famous 1630 text, which is John Winthrop's lay sermon, A Model of Christian Charity. And one of the reasons I want to take a look at this text is, well, first and foremost, that it's, it's where we tend to begin with canonical American literature. It's not always the case. There are, and increasingly this is more often the case, uh, professors who want to begin American literary history starting with indigenous texts, there are professors who will begin earlier, uh, begin with of Jamestown or of Plymouth Plantation. But most American lit surveys really do start with John Winthrop. And this is especially true in high school, uh, where the Puritans are discussed at all, which, again, increasingly is becoming less and less. But if you open most high school American literature anthologies, you will see towards the beginning, or perhaps at the very beginning, John Winthrop's lay sermon, A Model of Christian Charity. Now, one of the reasons I want to discuss this text is because in spite of the place it occupies in the national consciousness, which is enormous, right? Uh, the text has been quoted by, by giants like John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, so on and so forth. Uh, in spite of this sort of massiveness or, or this sort of gravity that the text holds in our, in our collective consciousness, it's actually a very little read text and a very little understood text. Even though, again, it appears in many anthologies and is, is allegedly taught in colleges, the teaching of it is usually very, very poor. And this isn't necessarily because Winthrop is giving us an extraordinarily complicated text. He's not using abstract theological language. He's not uh, speaking in, in any sort of complex philosophy. In fact, his, his prose is rather simple and direct. Uh, not a lot of rhetorical flourish or, or uh, complexity. Uh, but in spite of that, most Americans in our own time, they lack the prerequisite knowledge to be able to understand this text the way that Winthrop wanted it to be understood. What I mean by that is, if you were to sit in on the average uh, American literary establishment lecture on John Winthrop and on a model of Christian charity, what is usually said is, is something like this. John Winthrop gives a sermon on, on the Arbella, or, or perhaps before boarding the Arbella, on the way to the New World in 1630. And, you know, he says a lot of stuff, but what's really important is that last phrase, which Ronald Reagan uses, uh, we shall be as a city upon a hill. And really, this is the birth of American exceptionalism and Americans thinking that we have some sort of great national destiny that separates us from other peoples. And somehow this lecture gets extended out to 40 minutes or 50 minutes or whatever length of time the professor needs to fill. Uh, and, you know, there's applause and they pat themselves on the back as, as having said something very profound. When, in fact, they've glossed over 90 for, about 95% of the text uh, and have not really understood what, a, what Winthrop is getting at, which isn't necessarily a sense of American exceptionalism so much as it is what the title implies, a model of Christian charity, a model of the way that the Christian citizens of this new society are to behave themselves and are to act with respect towards each other. What Winthrop is doing here is not talking about so much uh, a, a great national destiny, though there is a certain sense in which he is, but he's really uh, outlining a document of political philosophy and political economy that is biblically based, that tries to take the teachings of Christ and extend them outwards to this new society in extraordinary circumstances. And in order to understand that, and again, in order to understand 95% of what Winthrop is saying in this sermon, you have to have some knowledge of the Bible. And the fact is, is that most Americans, again, even professors, high school teachers, so on and so forth, uh, have no biblical knowledge whatsoever. They've never cracked open a Bible. They may know some of the parables. They may know something like the Sermon on the Mount, uh, by reputation or by way of, of secondary texts or annotations. But the overwhelming majority of the people you see who are professors uh, have not opened the Bible at all and have no background knowledge or no prerequisite knowledge to be able to understand the overwhelming majority of, of history in the West. Without an understanding of the Bible, a text like this is utterly incomprehensible, which is why Puritanism uh, is very unfortunately neglected. We, again, see, I talked about you know, how this, this text appears in anthologies. But if you look at most American literature anthologies, the section on Puritanism, despite the fact that it covers, uh, you, could, you could make different arguments, but I would say about a good, almost 150 years of American history, the legacy of the Puritans, uh, very few texts appear. 
Uh, and really, the 19th century, in the early part of the 19th century, it, it not, occupies an enormous place. The, the volume on the American Romanticism, on, on Transcendentalism, is going to be very thick. The volume on the Puritans, if you just look at the Norton, is, is incredibly slim. There, there's this idea that there's not that much to say or there's not that much interesting going on. There's a couple different reasons for this. One is that the Puritans aren't writing literary texts in our contemporary modern understanding of literary. Again, this is a sermon we're going to be looking at. This is not a novel. The Puritans didn't write novel. They had no concept of the novel. There's very little in the way of Puritan poetry. That doesn't mean they're not great writers. In fact, I, I studied under a professor who actually said that William Bradford's Of Plymouth Plantation is a better text than The Great Gatsby and is, is more interesting and more literary. And there is a certain sense in which that's true. But you have to be able to move outside the modern understanding of literature as a great story. These are not great stories. These are incredibly well-written and moving and profound texts in our literature to the extent that they're well-written. But because of our modern bias, we tend to discount these texts as not being literature. We also tend to discount them because, again, we don't understand them. We are so far removed from anything that Winthrop could have conceived of as normal that we, we look at these texts and we feel as if they have come from an alien planet because in certain sense they have. They come from a world that is on the cusp of modernity but which is in many ways still influenced by pre-modern traditions and which is shaped by, by texts, by worldviews, uh, by paradigms which no longer are, are normative which no longer makes sense to the modern mind. And so consequently, we're frustrated when we look at these texts. They're often understood to be very boring, when in fact I would say they're, they're probably the most interesting texts or some of the most interesting texts that we have in American literature. And so we just kind of gloss over them. And so to that end, there are so many memes about Puritanism that get passed off as, as being erudite scholarship or as being uh, voracious in some way, when in fact they're just what I said. They're just memes. They, they have no basis in reality. And you see this in both left and right. There's a sort of left understanding of Puritanism which goes back to H.L. Mencken, which again has no relationship with the text at all, no, no relationship to history as it was actually lived, which says that, you know, you know the Puritans were just stodgy white men who, who hated sex and, and fun, uh, and they, they created a whole country of gloomy, sad, cold individuals who hate anything interesting or, or life-affirming, which is utterly false, uh, which does not bear out the reality of Puritanism, which I think is actually best expressed by C.S. Lewis when he says, if you want to understand Puritanism, you should think about Marxists in the 1950s and 1960s, because contrary to the way that we depict them now or the way that we understand them now, Puritanism was actually very radical. Uh, they were considered the most radical form of Protestants at the time, which is, of course, why they're kicked out of England, why they're kicked out of even a very religiously tolerant place like the Netherlands. Uh, and they're, they're much more, what would you say, they're, they're much more chic and cool than we now understand them. That a Puritan in the early part of the 17th century was much like a Marxist in the 1950s, 1960s. Which is, and this is nothing to say good about Marxism, but it just is a historical fact, that most Marxists in the 1950s and 1960s were young, attractive, very well read, very well cultured, very intelligent, and all other things being equal. People who weren't Marxists weren't those things. That doesn't make Marxism correct. doesn't mean Marxism is a, is a uh, proper understanding of the world or is ethical in any way. I'm certainly not a Marxist. But that was the reality. And Puritans were certainly this way. They were much more literate, much better read than the average population. They tended to be very intelligent. They tended to be very attractive. Uh, much more of a bias towards the young than the old. And in particular, this first generation of Puritans that made their way to, to Massachusetts Bay uh, were, were very attractive in many ways. And so this false understanding from the left really inhibits our ability to understand these texts equally as much as a false understanding from the right, the so-called American conservatives, the Republican Party types who try to say uh, these, these Puritans are the you know, our, our noble forebears in this experiment of American democracy, which is not at all the case. Now, I will make the argument later, uh, perhaps not in this lecture, but, it, but in other lectures on American Puritanism, that you do see the seeds of American liberalism kind of baked into the cake, so to speak, that, that liberalism really is always there, uh, and that even while the Puritans espouse very anti-liberal attitudes, there are aspects of their theology and of their politics that, that really do grow into the plant or the weed, rather, of liberalism. That is true, 
But if you look at the actual attitudes as they're lived during that period and, and taking aside these sort of seeds of something else that is to come, uh, the attitudes are incredibly anti-democratic. In fact, John Winthrop himself has nothing good to say about the idea of democracy. This is actually a quote from one of his letters, I believe. If we should change from a mixed aristocracy to a mere democracy, first we should have no warrant in scripture for it, for there was no such government in Israel. A democracy is, amongst civil nations, accounted the meanest and worst of all forms of government. To allow it would be a manifest breach of the fifth commandment. This is rather interesting, right? He's going to say, first and foremost, there's no biblical basis for democracy. I do not see democracy anywhere in the Bible. Therefore, if we're going to build what they, what they called our Bible commonwealth, this, this noble project of, of Massachusetts Bay, it cannot be democratic. And in fact, it has to be anti-democratic. And notice what he labels the project as. It's a mixed aristocracy. Even though Winthrop and many of the Puritans are from the middle classes, Winthrop uh, was, a, was a lawyer for a period of time and then later a justice of the peace, but thoroughly ensconced in a, in a very middle class uh, mercantile atmosphere, he wants to create an aristocracy. He is not trying to uh, enfranchise the entire population and give everyone an equal voice. He's not aiming for equality, very far from it. In fact, he's trying to reserve power into the hands of those he thinks uh, merit it the most and, and uh, keep power away from the masses who need to be tamed and need to be disciplined and restrained from their passions. He calls democracy the worst form of government and a breach of the fifth commandment, which if you don't know, the fifth commandment is honor thy father and honor thy mother. The idea here being that there is a relationship. This is something Winthrop will actually explicitly talk about in A Model of Christian Charity, that there is an organic relationship between natural systems and political systems, that the organization and structure of our body has an organic, a natural, and analogous relationship to how politics should be structured. And similarly, how a family should be structured is how the state should be structured how any form of government should be structured, that these things need to be on a certain level of equality and analogy, which is totally correct, and by the way, an excellent way of evaluating any political system or ideology. If it does not succeed as a form of government on every level of human organization, it is not proper political theory. It is unnatural and therefore evil to organize human beings in that manner. And that's certainly true of democracy. It's certainly true of liberalism, right? Uh, you cannot organize a family on anarcho-capitalist or on libertarian or on liberal principles or democratic principles for that matter. There can be democratic elements of a family structure. There can be times where things are taken to a vote, where everyone's opinions are taken uh, into account, uh, where a majority may prevail against a minority. But that is not the standard or the rule. You could not possibly run a household having children who have not yet attained the age of reason or a sufficient degree of maturity to govern themselves and allow them equal voice to the parents who are capable of governing them. You need the wiser, the more intelligent, the more experienced to serve as judges and as wise lawgivers to those who have not yet attained that degree of maturity or restraint over their passions. You could not raise a family on the principles that are, that are opposed to that. And so consequently, you should not expect a government that is based on these opposing principles to be successful or to be moral in any way. And this is why Winthrop actually, is, again, says democracy is opposed to the fifth commandment. Now, there's one more thing I want to get into before we start to dive into the specifics of the text. And we'll go through it line by line and point by point. But one thing I think we should all be clear on at the outset is that there's a very important reason for understanding the Puritans and a very important reason for understanding Winthrop in particular. Uh, one of my great intellectual heroes, a man I have a lot of respect for, uh, the American intellectual historian Perry Miller, will actually say that Winthrop stands at the forefront of our consciousness. And the reason why is, is something I think that Perry Miller alludes to in one of his articles, where he says that being an American is not so much something to be passively received as it is to be acquired. What he means by that is if you're born into a European tradition, if you're Hungarian, if you're Polish, if you're Spanish, if you're French, you're not constantly concerned with what it means to be those things. You have a thousand year history of what it means to be Spanish, of what it means to be Hungarian, of what it means to be Polish. Uh, and that permeates every aspect of life for you. The architecture you see, the art you see, the buildings you see, the language you use, so on and so forth. In America, that's not the case. We use English, which is a, a language that bears 
quite frankly, very little relationship to uh, the New World or the American uh, project or New Worldism in any real sense. And moreover, we don't have that tradition. We have about 400 years, but American tradition, quote unquote, is already on the cusp of modernity. And there's a lot of anxiety about what it means to be American precisely because the country is founded in such an inorganic way. Again, it's this sign of propositional nationhood of I will artificially separate myself from the natural form of government, from a monarchy, and decide for myself what the rules are out of thin air, not in an autochthonous sense, not in a sense in which they spring up from the ground or from the people organically, but by an act of will, which is what the Declaration of Independence and what the Constitution are. And so for many people, left and right, but particularly people on the right of a more reactionary or, or third positionist persuasion, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to reconcile with the facts of American history, or not so much the facts of American history as, as it is the American mythos. Because there's an understanding that all of our founding fathers have conceived of this nation in a way that is thoroughly anti-traditional, thoroughly uh, anti uh, any natural form of politics. And so there's a sense in which, well, maybe there can be no legitimate American traditionalism. And maybe I was just born into this country that is just this hotbed of liberalism, and that's the only tradition it has. And I, as someone who sees myself as opposed to that tradition, have, have no figures to grapple with. I have no noble forefathers. And in fact, that's actually the opposite of what is true. Because again, there is a very large swath of American history, about 150 years prior uh, to the creation of the Constitution. And that history is incredibly important and worth reconciling with. And when we understand the Puritans as they were, and not as we want them to be, we come to see that the, our noble forefathers, our ancestors, the founders of the American tradition, were anti-democratic and were in favor of a, a form of politics that in many ways has a profound lineage with the pre-modern and that can be reconciled with the form of traditionalism that we espouse. And this is one of the big reasons why I think the Puritans need to be more well studied, uh, particularly by people of our persuasion, but it's just also more generally. Because when you come to understand the Puritans on their own terms, you realize that this sort of myth of America as being conceived in liberty and as being a country of all about freedoms and rights and tolerance and equality is, is voluntarist, is something that in a very Nietzschean sense is just fabricated in a, in a, in a factory of, uh, of morals and myth-making, that it's something that individual men decided to impose with their false interpretations of history, impose on the American populace by an act of will. And it's always been a position of a very small minority of Americans and has no real relationship to the heart of the American project or the American people as such. That the American people who hold on to a sense of Americanness in a deep unconscious way uh, instinctively revolt against this idea of American history as all being about liberties and about freedoms, even as they may with their lips espouse it. Winthrop for us should be remembered as an archetypal figure the archetype of the wise judge, the archetype of the lawgiver, and the archetype really of the good American system of governance, the good American governor. This is the way you can see him in a more drawn out sense if you're interested in this. Uh, you can see him portrayed by Edmund Morgan, another historian I have a lot of respect for, a historian who was actually a student of Perry Miller's. You can take a look at his book, The Puritan Dilemma, in which he says Winthrop should be remembered as a great national hero. Unfortunately, he's, he's rather forgotten for what he really was. But Edmund Morgan understands him as espousing a sort of via media between extremes and that he was incredibly adroit, uh, incredibly skilled and gifted at navigating all these different extreme uh, religious, theological and political positions and keeping a level head and keeping a good system of governance. And as we'll come to see as a man, he is incredibly virtuous, and he's the kind of man that you would all want your sons to emulate and become like, and is someone that you should strive to emulate and become like. Indeed, Cotton Mather actually writes part of the Magnalia Christi Americana as a series of biographies, as a sort of Plutarch's lives of eminent American Puritans, uh, to be a sort of emulatory model for young Americans. And when he writes about John Winthrop, he's going to stylize him as Nehemias Americanus, or the American Nehemiah. Because if you don't know, the biblical Nehemiah, what he's most well-renowned for, what his uh, sort of type in the Bible is, is of magnanimity, 
is of being someone who exhorts the Hebrew people to be generous to one another, to lend to one another, to give to one another, to embrace the Christian idea of charity. And this is what John Winthrop does in his own personal life. If you read the Wikipedia, which of course approaches everything from a very secular, modern, progressive sort of angle, uh, Winthrop's financial troubles are all the results of his bad investments, just being a bad businessman, not taking care of his affairs. But if you read Cotton Mather's account, which is substantially more accurate, substantially closer to the truth, and substantially closer chronologically to, to John Winthrop, Mather says it's because he was well known for doing exactly what he's going to exhort the Puritans to do in a model of Christian charity, which is to give to everyone who asks of you, which is actually, if you know your Bible, what Christ exhorts us all to do. And it is precisely this social, political, economic doctrine that gets expounded upon in his lay sermon. It, of course, uses the biblical text as a sort of uh, meeting point or as a sort of way of grounding his analysis in, in his, uh, his theoretical framework. But that's not to say it's not dealing with things that are extra biblical. He's not dealing with things that solely pertain to theology. They pertain to all aspects of life. They pertain to politics, they pertain to economics, and they pertain to society. And what he's going to open with, and this is rather interesting, right, and perhaps rather surprising for us who want to see Winthrop as a founding father in the vein of someone like a Jefferson or a Washington, is that he begins with the idea of inequality. He begins with the fact that God has foreordained for men to be unequal in terms of ability and wealth, and that this is actually to the glory of God. So with no further ado, let's actually open up now and let's take a look at this sermon and start to move line by line and see what Winthrop is doing in this text. The text begins as follows. God Almighty in his most holy and wise providence hath so disposed of the condition of mankind as in all times some must be rich, some poor, some high and eminent in power and dignity, others mean and in submission. Now again, notice the opening. This is all about how the human race is conceived in inequality, at least in his fallen state. And he will come to address the unfallen state in a little bit. But in the fallen state, we are unequal. As Christ says, the poor will always be with you. There are always going to be rich. There are always going to be poor. There are always going to be powerful. There are always going to be weak. There are always going to be masters. There are always going to be slaves. This is a necessary part of life for Winthrop. And this is actually what's called the doctrine of the sermon. The Puritan sermon is actually a very rigorous, very, how would you say, a very schematic genre, and it follows a set series of steps. Typically, the Puritan sermon is going to begin with something called the quotation, which is just the quote from the biblical text. So, for example, Jonathan Edwards' very, same, very famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, is going to begin with, His foot shall slip in due time, from Deuteronomy. And after this quotation is provided, you get explication, which is the explanation of this particular quote, taking a look at what others have said about it, trying to analyze it, break it down to constituent parts and figure out what is going on. Once the quote has been broken down, once you have the quotation and the explication, you get the third part, which is the doctrine. In other words, what we must believe now that we have taken a look at what the Bible says. Winthrop skips the first two parts here. There's no quotation or explication. He begins straight with the doctrine, which is that inequality is a fact of life, and God has willed life to be this way in the fallen state, and there is nothing that can be done about it. Now, after you get the doctrine, you move into the next parts of the genre of the sermon. So once you have doctrine, you then move into what are called reasons, which explain, in other words, why the doctrine is this way, how it relates to the biblical text, why we must understand things this way. And then from reasons, question and answer, objections, some, as it's sometimes called, attempts to quarrel with the particular doctrine and say, well, that can't possibly be right. There has to be some other way of seeing this. And once all the objections and questions have been answered, bear in mind, this is not a call out session. Nobody's calling out these questions and answers. Winthrop or whoever is giving the sermon is going to anticipate these objections and try to answer them. Once all the objections have been answered, you move into the last part of the sermon, which is the application. In other words, how do we apply now this doctrine to our everyday lives as Christians, and how should this doctrine help us change our behavior? Here we're going to see that Winthrop gives us three big reasons. First reason, 
first to hold conformity with the rest of his world, being delighted to show forth the glory of his wisdom in the variety and difference of the creatures, and the glory of his power in ordering all these differences for the preservation and good of the whole, and the glory of his greatness, that as it is the glory of princes to have many officers, so this great king will have many stewards, counting himself more honored in dispensing his gifts to man by man than if he did it by his own immediate hands. So in other words, God is glorified in the differences of estates between man, that all men are not equal precisely because in the manifestation of this variety and diversity of creation, we can see the glory of God, the power and the munificence of the benevolent God who has ordered men to all these different states. Second reason. Secondly, that he may have the more occasion to manifest the work of his spirit, first upon the wicked in moderating and restraining them, so that the rich and mighty should not eat up the poor, nor the poor and despised rise up against and shake off their yoke. Secondly, in the regenerate, in exercising his graces in them, as in the great ones, their love, mercy, gentleness, temperance, etc., and in the poor inferior sort, in their faith, their patience and obedience, so on and so forth. Again, notice, kind of two sub-reasons here. The last one he's talking about is essentially because it improves virtue, right? That some must be poor in order to obtain certain virtues, and that there are certain virtues that can only be obtained when one is wealthy. Notice, Winthrop is not saying it's bad to have wealth. It's not evil to have uh, stockpiled resources, to, be, uh, to abound in these sorts of materials. Quite the contrary. It's fine to have them. In fact, it's a good thing to have them. What matters is recognizing that they are not your private property. You do not have ownership over them. You are a steward over these resources. And it is your obligation, and it is a grave obligation, to use those resources properly. Now, the differences in wealth can also be used by God to moderate and restrain the wicked. He can make a rich man who is going to use it for very evil purposes. Uh, he can, out of love, take the money away from him to prevent him from using it on his lusts and on his passions, so on and so forth. And that in a Christian society, you will see a balance that the rich will not oppress the poor and the poor will not rise up against the rich. And that this is specifically the product of what Winthrop will later talk about as a Christian corporate love. Third reason. Thirdly, that every man may have need of others, and from hence they might be all knit more nearly together in the bonds of brotherly affection. Very interesting. From hence it appears plainly that no man is made more honorable than another or more wealthy, etc., out of any particular and singular respect to himself, but for the glory of his creator, notice how often he repeats glory of the creator, and the common good of the creature, man. Therefore God still reserved the property of these gifts to himself, as in Ezekiel 16:17. He there calls wealth his gold and his silver. And Proverbs 3, 9, he claims their service as his due. All men being thus by divine providence ranked into two sorts, rich and poor, under the first are comprehended all as such as are able to live comfortably by their own means duly improved. And all others are poor according to the former distribution. Now this is very, very key. We have rich and we have poor so that society may be cohesive. And this runs contrary to all modern doctrines of, of economics, right? Whether you're talking right or left, because they're both ultimately anti-human, uh, anti-Christian ideas about economics. And the free market side, the idea is, well, uh, we can all be rich. We'll all be rich in different gradation. Uh, you'll have a smaller slice of a bigger and bigger pie. And, you know, I might have a bigger slice of a bigger and bigger pie. But if we all embrace the free market liberal ideology, the pie is just going to get bigger and bigger, right? This is the whole thing with, oh, don't you have a bigger TV than you had 30 years ago? So on and so forth. Uh, you, yeah, you have a small slice, you know, you don't have anywhere near as much money as the super billionaires, but your slice of the pie, even if it's small, is actually growing. And you should, you should be happy about that. Uh, on the left, you have the idea that we need to be all equal in terms of wealth and that we should try to remove wealth inequality and level out these differences. Winthrop is saying neither of these things. He's saying there needs to be rich and there needs to be poor and real poor, not uh, relative poor, actual poverty so that we have need of each other. Because if everyone was rich and self-sufficient or if everyone uh, was on the same playing field in a sort of communist sense, we wouldn't have need of each other. We wouldn't be reliant upon each other. And it is, in fact, the fact that some people are very rich and the poor must make supplication to them that bonds us together in Christian love and is a sort of glue that unites society together and allows it to function cohesively. That, in fact, these differences in wealth God has foreordained so that we can be bound together in Christian love. Now, notice the topic 
What Winthrop is beginning with in the Sermon on the Arbella, as they are beginning to sail to the New World, is what a cohesive vision of Christian society should look like. He's reminding everyone that there are going to be differences and that we are going to want to envy others for their worldly goods. You are going to be avaricious. You are going to have these evil passions and desires, but that we must fight against them and mitigate them. He's trying to say that we have a chance to start things over in the new world, that we're on virgin land in virgin territory, and we can really do things over and live in a society according to the law of love. And that this isn't going to be utopia in the sense where everyone is going to have things perfectly. Far from it. They're going to be very rich and very poor. But that if we willingly embrace this and take this upon ourselves as Christians, as a bearing of the cross and an understanding that we live in a fallen world, we can have something much better. Now, he continues forward as follows. There are two rules whereby we are to walk one towards another, in justice and in mercy. These are always distinguished in their act and their object. Yet may they both concur in the same subject in each respect, as sometimes there may be an occasion of showing mercy to a rich man in some sudden danger or distress, and also of doing mere justice to a poor man in regard of some particular contract, etc. So there's a double law. There is justice and there is mercy, and we have to walk according to each of these. There are some circumstances which demand strict justice. There are some circumstances which demand a sort of more indulgent form of mercy, but we always need to moderate all of our behavior according to justice and mercy, and that we should strive to become just and strive to become merciful. He continues forward. There is likewise, by way of analogy, a double law by which we are regulated in our conversation towards another. In both the former respects, the law of nature and the law of grace, that is the moral law or the law of the gospel, to omit the rule of justice as not properly belonging to this purpose, otherwise than it may fall into consideration in some particular cases. By the first of these laws, man, as he was enabled, so withal, is commanded to love his neighbor as himself. Upon this ground stands all the precepts of the moral law, which concern our dealings with men. To apply this to the works of mercy, this law requires two things. First, that every man afford his help to another in every want or distress. Secondly, that he perform this out of the same affection, which makes him careful of his own goods, according to the words of our Savior from Matthew 7, 2, whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, etc. This was practiced by Abraham and Lot in entertaining the angels and in the old man of Gibeah. The law of grace or of the gospel hath some difference from the former, which is the law of nature, as in these respects. First, the law of nature was given to man in the state of innocence. This of the gospel is in the state of regeneracy. Secondly, the former propounds one man to another as the same flesh and image of God. This as a brother in Christ also, and in the communion of the same spirit, and so teacheth to put a difference between Christians and others, do good to all, especially to the household of faith. Upon this ground the Israelites were to put a difference between the brethren of such as were strangers, though not of the Canaanites. Thirdly, the law of nature would give no rules for dealing with enemies, for all are to be considered as friends in the state of innocence, but the gospel commands to love an enemy. Proof, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Love your enemies, do good to them that hate you. Matthew 5, 44. Okay, very interesting here. What Winthrop is getting at in this twofold distinction is that there are two separate systems of law. And very interestingly, he's not talking about natural law in the, the Catholic sense or, or even in the secular sense of natural law, the pagan sense of natural law, rather, where we look at man on a purely natural plane, absent the supernatural, and we see that even man, absent any considerations of God, has certain ethical norms that are universal, whether or not one is a Christian. When Winthrop says the law of nature, he actually means the exact opposite of that. He's not talking about man on a natural plane or a so-called natural plane, absent God. He's talking about man in the state of nature as he was intended to be created. When Winthrop mentions the state of nature, he's one of the few philosophers, and in particular, one of the few English philosophers who properly understands the state of nature. The state of nature is not man absent God. The state of nature is man in paradise. What God created us for, what is natural to us, is to be in paradise and to have full bodily integrity and to not experience the evils of sin, death, and the passions. It's only in our fallen state that we have death, that we have passions, that we have sin, that we have evil, strife, so on and so forth. We often talk about uh, 
perverse sexual desires or the desire uh, to injure others or to be angry, so on and so forth, as, oh, well, that's human, that's natural. But what Winthrop is saying correctly is that those things are not natural. They're not inherent to man. God did not create man to be that way. Man chose to become that way by disobeying God because the wages of sin are death. And so death reigns in our body and reigns over all our members. But that's unnatural. It's unnatural to die. It's unnatural for the soul to be separated from the body. It's unnatural to experience perverse desires and passions. In nature, we don't have those things because nature is being in Eden. Nature is paradise. Nature is union with God. Then there is the law of grace. So after man falls and experiences sin, we have the law of what Winthrop will call regeneracy. When we come back to a state of grace, when we can become reunited with God, if we are of the elect, right? Remember, he's a Calvinist. Uh, but if we are of the elect, we are regenerated. We can come back into union with God. And there are key differences here. In the law of nature, one has to love one's neighbor as oneself, uh, meaning that if something uh, bad happens to someone else or someone is privated, I have to love their body as it were my body. Winthrop says the difference between the law of nature and the law of grace are these threefold differences, which come down to fundamentally that in the law of grace, because we're still operating in fallen flesh, because we are still imperfect, because we are still laboring under the pains of sin, this love is still manifested in this life imperfectly that this love can only be extended to our fellow Christian brethren and that it cannot be extended in all circumstances and times, right? I mean, just imagine if, if every single Christian uh, who is in help or, or needed help or was in distress in some way, uh, you had to go help them. It would, it would be impossible, right? In the state of nature, in the state of initial integrity, these things might be possible. But we're limited as fallen men and there's only so much we can do, at least under normal circumstances, because now this is where Winthrop is going to put in the caveat and really going to try to spur his fellow Puritans into moving closer to the law of nature and of trying to bind themselves more powerfully to the needs of their Christian brethren. The law of the gospel, remember, not the law of nature, not the law of unfallen man, but the law of fallen man redeemed by Christ propounds likewise a difference of seasons and occasions. There is a time when a Christian must sell all and give to the poor, as they did in the apostles' times. There is a time also when Christians, though they give not all yet, must give beyond their ability, as they of Macedonia, 2 Corinthians 8. Likewise, community of perils calls for extraordinary liberality, and so doth community in some special service for the church. Now, what is he saying here? He's saying, look, there's these different times and occasions. And in apostolic times, you are obligated to sell all that you had and give to the poor. He's saying in extraordinary circumstances, you must give beyond your natural ability. You know, there's a, you have, you know, a thousand dollars, you maybe need to spend 900 of it a month to have your subsistence for you and your family and your loved ones, but you have a hundred dollars left over that you can save up. Well, you're able to give up that a hundred dollars without any sort of natural plain issues. But what Winthrop is saying is in extraordinary circumstances, if someone, one of your Christian brethren needs $200, you don't get to go to him and say, sorry, I only have $100 left over. You're obligated to give him that $200 because the extraordinary circumstances call for extraordinary liberality. And this is what he's going to say is the case with the apostolic mission of Massachusetts Bay. Continuing forward. Lastly, when there is no other means whereby our Christian brother may be relieved in his distress, we must help him beyond our ability, rather than tempt God in putting him upon help by miraculous or extraordinary means. So in other words, even if we're not in an extraordinary circumstance, when we see that a Christian brother is in distress, when we see, for example, this is not the Christian brother, but you see the Samaritan, right, who is, who is in the ditch, uh, and no one is going to help him, everyone is going to pass by, you don't get to just go to your closet and pray and say, God, please help this person. No, you are now the person who is obligated to help them, even if it means giving beyond your ability to give. Now, how do we exercise what Winthrop calls this duty of mercy? He says there are three ways. In giving, meaning in, in, in just giving one's goods uh, without any sort of string or attachment. In lending, allowing someone to use your goods temporarily and getting them back without interest. Winthrop is totally against the idea of, of usury amongst Christian brethren. Without interest, lending, and asking back for the principle, and of forgiving a debt. So in other words, someone owes you something, you extend them mercy, 
by saying, you no longer owe me anything. Now, Winthrop is going to anticipate all of the objections to this because, of course, this makes people uncomfortable, as it makes many people in our own time uncomfortable. I get many, many objections from students saying, how could he have possibly believed this, so on and so forth. I mean, if you imagine it, right, Im imagine just asking someone and saying, look, uh, I'm in extraordinary circumstances. If I don't come up with $1,200 by the end of the month, I don't have rent and my, f my family and I are going to get evicted. Well, even if they're your Christian brother, uh, are they going to give you the money? They might try to help in some way, but most people will not give you the money, even if they have it, even if it's part of, of uh, what Winthrop would call uh, the normal circumstances where you have that money sitting left over and it's not calling you to go above and beyond your means. They're not very likely to give it to you. And certainly most people object to any idea of giving beyond your means. Most people say, uh, no, you should never, ever sacrifice uh, what is rightfully yours, quote unquote, or rightfully your family's for the sake of someone else, for the sake of your church, so on and so forth. Regardless of what the circumstances are, self-preservation is first and foremost. Well, Winthrop is going to say this is not the case. This is not at all the case. And the objections are answered as follows. First question, what rules shall a man observe in giving in respect to the measure? Meaning, well, how is this moderated? How is someone supposed to figure out when to do what? Winthrop answers, if the time and occasion be ordinary, he is to give out of his abundance, as we've previously cleared up. Under ordinary circumstances, you have 100 bucks over the, at the end of the month, you can give out of that $100. Let him lay aside as God hath blessed him. If the time and occasion be extraordinary, he must be ruled by them, by this extraordinary circumstance. Taking this withal, that then a man cannot likely do too much, especially if he may leave himself and his family under probable means of comfortable subsistence. Meaning, if one of your Christian brethren is in need and you don't really have the money, it's going to cause you to be privated in some way, trust in God and give anyway. That's what he's asking people to do. This is a, this is a social doctrine, an economic doctrine, that when you see a Christian brother in need and they are seriously being hurt, under serious danger, and we're in extraordinary circumstances, we're out in the wilderness, you know, very, very far away from home, far away from supplies, far away from anything that could provide any sort of sucker for us, then yes, you're obligated to give out of not just your abundance, but out of that which uh, you need. Second objection, a man must lay up for posterity. The fathers lay up for posterity and children, and he is worse than an infidel that provideth not for his own, based on the biblical quotation posted, posted above here. In other words, well, look, if you take away from the things that you need, you're not providing for your children. And it's perfectly all right to try to lay up an inheritance for your children, for your posterity. And if you don't take care of the ones of your own household, then, as St. Paul says, you are worse than a pagan. You are worse than an infidel. How do you answer this, John Winthrop? with our response. For the first, it is plain that it is spoken by way of comparison. It must be meant of the, extra the ordinary and usual course of fathers and cannot extend to times and occasions extraordinary, like the present for Winthrop. For the other place, the apostle speaks against such as walked inordinately, and it is without question that he is worse than an infidel who through his own sloth and voluptuousness shall neglect to provide for his family. So in other words, he's saying, only when this is done out of sin is it a bad thing. So if you don't provide through your own family because you're a drunkard, uh, because you're addicted to drugs, uh, because you're lazy and you don't want to work, then you are worse than an infidel or a pagan. Right? You're doing this out of selfishness and out of sin. But if you don't provide fully for your family because you are trying to help a Christian brother in distress, this is virtuous and there is nothing wrong with this. And in fact, the implication seems to be that this is a, a sort of selfishness masquerading as selflessness. Oh, I need to provide for my family is a way of getting out of the obligation that circumstances can impose on one. Continuing forward, another objection. The wise man's eyes are in his head, saith Solomon, and foresee it the plague. Therefore he must forecast and lay up against evil times when he or his may stand in need of all he can gather. So in other words, well, evil times may come upon us. There might be a great persecution. There might be a famine, so on and so forth. So no, we should save up for the future when things might be worse. You can't just give to everyone who asks of you, as Christ says. Winthrop, this very argument Solomon useth to persuade to liberality. And this is in Ecclesiastes 11. 
Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou knowest not what evil may come upon the land. Luke 16, 9. Make you friends of the riches of iniquity. You will ask how this shall be. Very well. For first he that gives to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him even in this life and hundredfold to him or his. The righteous is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed enjoyeth the blessing. And besides, we know what advantage it will be to us in the day of account, when many such witnesses shall stand forth for us to witness the improvement of our talent, our initial investment, what we loaned, what we gave to our brother. And I would know of those who plead so much for laying up for the time to come, whether they hold that to be gospel, Matthew 16, 19, sorry, 6, 19, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, etc. If they acknowledge it, what extent will they allow it? If only to those primitive times, let them consider the reason whereupon our Savior grounds it. The first is that they are subject to the moth, the rust, the thief. Secondly, they will steal away the heart. Where the treasure is, there will your heart be also. So in other words, he's saying to those of you who think you can just lay things up, what does Christ say? Uh, here where you lay up treasure, the moth eats them, the thief takes them away, government inflation makes it less valuable, so on and so forth. Uh, moreover, the more you abound in riches, this is what St. Basil the Great says, the more you abound in riches, the less you abound in love. The more attached all things being equal, you are likely going to be to them. And the more riches you have, the more virtuous and more saintly you have to be to be detached from them. Because where your treasure is, there your heart is also. He's saying this parable of Solomon, and you can see this in many of the, uh, the biblical uh, Proverbs of Solomon, where it talks about laying up money, having a firm financial foundation, so on and so forth. It's not that the Christian man should be unconcerned with money. Particularly if he's married, he should. If he's living a life in the world, he should. But he's saying the whole point of being concerned with money and having the firm financial foundation is so that you can be liberal and so that you can be always giving to your neighbors, not just in uh, some sort of later time when things look really bad, but constantly as a means of constant improvement and virtue. He continues forward. The reasons are of like force at all times. Therefore, the exhortation must be general and perpetual with always in respect of the love and affection to riches and in regard of the things themselves, when any special service for the church or particular distress of our brother do call for the ready use of them. Otherwise, it is not only lawful, but necessary to lay up as Joseph did to have ready upon such occasions, as the Lord, whose stewards we are of them, shall call for them for from us. Christ gives us an instance of the first when he sent his disciples for the donkey and bids them answer the owner thus, the Lord hath need of him. Okay. Now he goes on to give more examples of this. But what Winthrop is saying again is that the Puritan notion of property is not that we are owners of private property, that my property is an inalienable extension of me, as many libertarians, uh, anarcho-capitalists, uh, free market types will go on to say. Right? This is the problem with the whole libertarian anthropology. If you read uh, Murray Rothbard's famous work on this, uh, Man, Economy, and State, or you read you know, John Locke, or you read any of these great liberal thinkers or thinkers in this, this liberal vein, they all begin with a state of nature that has no account of God. The Lockean idea is, well, I have my body. I'm a complete owner of my body and sovereign over my body. And when I mix my body with uh, resources I find out in the external, lore, uh, external world, and I mix my labor with them, they now become extensions of myself. So if I see a tree and I cut it down, that tree is now my property because I've mixed my labor with it. And now, therefore, it is now an extension of me. And if you steal my tree, it's like you're stealing my bodily autonomy. You're violating something that's sacred. Winthrop has no notion of this. Of course, he believes that you know property is private. It's not all held in common. But what he's trying to say is, fundamentally, nothing you have is yours. You're a steward of a resource. Everything you have, from your body to your possessions, is God. And it is incredibly pleasing to God that he can take what looks like is yours and use it for some other use. So when Christ is in Jerusalem, he takes the donkey from the owner in what looks like a theft, but is not a theft because Christ is the owner of all things. Uh, and therefore, Winthrop is saying, us Puritans must always keep in mind that this anthropological vision, that we are not the owners of our own body, that we're not the owners of things that seem like our property, and that we are to be stewards of these resources in a Christian manner. Moreover, which comes punctually to this conclusion, if thy brother be in want and thou canst help him, thou needest not make doubt of what thou shouldst do. If thou lovest God, thou must help him. In other words, when you see your Christian brother in distress, it is a moment where God is asking you, do you love me or not? 
Because if you love me, you will lend to your brother. Because in lending to your brother, you are lending to me. You are lending to Christ. And if you deny him, you are denying me. You are denying Christ. We are called upon in all circumstances to help our Christian brethren when they are in need. This is what Winthrop is saying. Now, many people object to this because, of course, charity has grown cold in our own time and most people are completely incapable of doing this. I mean, most people, when you bring up the notion of tithing, panic, right? Most people, when you bring up the notion of really having to give up any material resources at all to the to the church or to a Christian brother in need, will make all sorts of objections of, oh, what are they going to do with the money? Are they going to be prudent stewards of it? So, you know, all these different things. Am I going to get interest back, right? Bringing in, in usury, all these different things. Winthrop does away with all that and cuts through it and says, look, are you going to be the one who helps Christ and gives him back what is his or not? It's really that simple. And again, we kind of balk at this. But I think our response needs to be, that is incredible. I'm incapable of doing that. How shameful. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. In other words, to say that is incredible that people used to think that way and people used to be able to live that way. Clearly, we're living in a very fallen time and a time that is very far from God that we're incapable of doing that. May the Lord give us the strength to do that again. It's recognizing our insufficiency and accusing ourselves of our failures. That's pleasing to God. A humble and contrite heart God will not despise. But what is wrong, I think, is to say Winthrop is being excessively idealistic or, or to say what I've, I've heard some people say is that well, Winthrop is endorsing a form of communism or of Marxism or some ridiculous uh, imagization of the eschaton that could not possibly uh, be a way for people to live their lives. No, you read Cotton Mather's Magnalia Christi Americana. It's very clear Winthrop lived his life this way. Anyone who was in need, Winthrop did everything he possibly could to help them, even giving out of that which he did not uh, really have to give out of what was needed for his family and for their estate in order to help his Christian brethren. Next question. What rule must we observe in lending? Well, okay, you, you've you specified giving, you specified uh, these different objections and given fair answers to them. How am I to determine how to lend to per someone, uh, how much to lend to them, so on and so forth? Thou must observe whether thy brother hath present or probable or possible means of repaying thee. If there be none of these, thou must give him according to his necessity, rather than lend him as he requires or requests. Now, this is very interesting. So, your Christian brother comes up to you and says, I need $100,000. According to Winthrop, you if he doesn't have the means to pay you $100,000 ever, you can say, look, I'm sorry, I, do, I don't think you'll ever be able to repay that. Uh, moreover, I think you're asking for more than you need. If I look at your needs, it looks like you actually really only need maybe $23,000, and I'm, I'm happy to give that to you. And in fact, it's not just, uh, you know, the supererogatory work, it's actually your obligation. If he needs the $23,000, it doesn't matter if he asks you for a million dollars and asks you for something ridiculous. If he needs the $23,000, you have to give him and loan him exactly what he needs. You're not obligated to loan him what he asks you for, but you are obligated to loan him what his actual need is. If he hath present means of repaying thee, thou art to look at him not as an act of mercy, but by way of commerce, wherein thou art to walk by the rule of justice. But if his means of repaying thee be only probable or possible, then he is an object of thy mercy. Thou must lend him, though there be danger of losing it. And then he cites from Deuteronomy 15, 7 and 8. If any of thy brethren be poor, thou shalt lend to him sufficient. That men might not shift off this duty by apparent hazard, he tells them that though the year of Jubilee were at hand, when he must remit it if he were not able to pay before, again, the year of Jubilee, all debts are wiped out. You can look at the Old Testament for more on this. Yet he must lend him. In other words, even if the year of Jubilee, when all the debts are, are about to be wiped out, is about to occur, you still have to lend to your brother and to do it with a smile and that cheerfully. It may not grieve thee to give him, saith he, and because some might object, why so I should soon impoverish myself and my family, he adds with all thy work, for our Savior said, from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away. What rule must we observe in forgiving a debt? Winthrop says, whether thou didst lend by way of commerce or in mercy, if he hath nothing to pay thee, thou must forgive. In other words, if he took out a loan from you and he has no way of repaying you, what do you do? Uh, do you exact a usurious rate of interest? Do you, do you uh, demand a balloon payment? Do you try to seize all of his, uh, his property, the property of his family? Do you put him in debtor's prison? No, we're Christians. 
what you do is forgive the debt. Forgive them their debts as you want your own debts to be forgiven. Just as you want God the Father to forgive you your sins, so you too should forgive them their debt. Now, this is an entirely alien system of economics and, and, and of political economy. Winthrop is arguing that society needs to be on the, made on the basis of these types of economic transactions between Christians, which are not done on free market logic. Right? The free market supposes an anthropology where we're always looking out for our self-interest, while we're always trying to make a buck, where the only way we can possibly ever denominate value is by money, and that all we ever want to do is accumulate more and more of this in the most efficient way possible. Winthrop is saying, no, as Christians, we're not operating on the law of carnal nature. We're operating in this law of grace, this law of regeneracy that enables our economic transactions to not be rational, quote unquote, by, by way of the free market economists, but instead to be irrational, to be on the basis of love and of our corporate bonds to one another. Now, it's on this topic of the corporate body that I think Winthrop is actually the most interesting because Winthrop's politics can with some justice be characterized as corporatist. And I don't mean that in, in a sort of facetious way. I mean, he literally is talking about the political, the government body, as being analogous to the human body. He's going to go on to say that just as a human body needs different organs and needs to be well governed, so too the body of Christ is governed much as a human body, and so too our civil, worldly authority must also be constituted as a body. And this is the central thesis of corporatism in the 20th century. It's a bit different in that corporatism really wants to understand the different organs of society as not being so much individuals as collective organizations, right? Uh, say, say all the machinists gather together or all uh, the factory workers gather together, all the welders gather together, all the educators gather together and form corporate entities that cooperate with each other and that, that engage with each other and make deals with each other. Uh, no, Winthrop doesn't believe that and he's not trying to resurrect a sort of medieval guild system, but he is saying something that has an affinity with political naturalism or political organicism. He is saying that the government body must be structured like the human body, that human beings have unique historical destiny as human beings, that God constituted the human body in such a way as to offer us a parable or an analogy of how we are to be governed in society, and that just as the human body, so too must the government body also be. And so when he talks about this idea of Christian love, and he talks about the idea of how we are to uh, deal with each other, to, to engage in transactions with respect to each other, it's always going to be using this metaphor of the body. Thus, Winthrop says as follows, the definition which scripture gives us of love is this, love is the bond of perfection. First, it is a bond or ligament. Secondly, it makes the work perfect. There is no body but consists of parts, and that which knits these parts together gives the body its perfection, because it makes each part so contiguous to others, as thereby they do mutually participate with each other, both in strength and infirmity, in pleasure and in pain. What we want is love, because when the different parts of society are integrated together by love, when one part is suffering, all parts of the body suffer. It's not that when one part suffers, the other part gains. No, no, no. If your liver is suffering, it's not like your brain is happy uh, because right, the free market uh, vision of the human body. Oh, the, the liver is getting less sugar uh, and is getting less key resources. Uh, therefore, the brain must have more, right? This vision of scarcity that predominates the free market thinking, that predominates the liberal worldview, the anarcho-capitalist worldview. Oh, you have less, therefore I must have more. No, 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 no. Uh, what Winthrop is saying is that's sickness, that's illness. The bond of love says, when you are suffering, I must be suffering also. And when I am rejoicing, you too must be rejoicing because we are so united together by love that actually some of the differences between us to the extent that they can in this fallen world start to evaporate and we start to meld into each other. Winthrop is not conceiving of the political in terms of the individual. He's not talking about sovereign individuals. He's talking about the body politic the ideal form of government as being something which dissolves individuality into something greater than itself. That, in other words, when we work together and cooperate, we can multiply our forces. It's actually what Mussolini says the ideal of government is. Mussolini says what the government should strive to do is multiply the force of the individual. Well, so too with Winthrop's bond of love, that when we are bound together in this work perfecting ligament of love that unites us all together, 
our forces as individuals will be multiplied and we will no longer conceive of ourselves in purely individual terms. And this can actually happen in this life at the smallest level of government in the family. When the husband and wife love each other, if they are doing what St. Paul asks, there really is no longer husband or wife, but one body. And that is the great mystery of the sacrament of marriage. And from that one body uh, come forth children who are quite literally the union of body of these two separate bodies, that what was once divided has now become united. And this happens in even very mysterious and mystical ways uh, that science is starting to catch on to. It's been a well-observed phenomenon that after several years of marriage, happy couples actually start to physically look like each other. That if you're in several years of happy marriage, maybe you notice this if your parents had a happy marriage, if your parents had a happy marriage and you look at them, you'll notice that their faces, they resemble the face of the one that they love from contemplating on them, from thinking about them, from being united to their affections and to their emotions. They start to take on the body of the one that they love, and the two really do become one flesh. And for Winthrop, this model is a model for all of human society. Again, I, perhaps I repeat too much, but you notice that it's like a cake, that there are analogies between each segment of society, that the governance of the individual body should mirror the governance of the family, should mirror the governance of the body politic at large. This is Winthrop's vision. It's political naturalism, political organicism, and in a certain sense, without taking too far, it's American corporatism. And moreover, he's not just going to talk about unity as being a good thing. He's going to talk about uh, alienation, separation, individuation as actually being a, a sort of illness or disease. The several parts of this body considered a part before they were united were as disproportionate and as much disordering as so many contrary qualities or elements. But when Christ comes and by his spirit and love knits all these parts to himself and to each other, it becomes the most perfect and best proportioned body in the world. Christ, by whom all the body being knit together by every joint for the furniture thereof, according to the effectual power, which is in the measure of every perfection of parts, a glorious body without spot or wrinkle, the ligaments hereof being Christ, or his love, for Christ is love. So the definition is right. Love is the bond of perfection. Now again, he speaks here of the church, but he's going to make it clear that this extends outward to the civil body. Now, of course, I think Winthrop is incorrect in identifying what the church is. The, the Puritan ecclesiology is, is absolutely ludicrous and is very far uh, from, from the orthodox notion of proper ecclesiology. And Winthrop did not know where the true church was, unfortunately. But his understanding that there are analogies between the structure of the church, the structure of the human body, and the structure of the body politic is fundamentally correct and is something that we as moderns have, have utterly lost. The metaphor continues later on when he says, The mouth is at all the pains to receive and mince the food which serves for the nourishment of all the other parts of the body. Yet it hath no cause to complain. First, the other parts send back by several passages a due proportion of the same nourishment in a better form for the strengthening and comforting of the mouth. So if you eat, I don't know, chicken or peas, the mouth cannot directly turn chicken and peas to the nourishment of the cells. So therefore, the mouth doesn't begrudge its duty in having to chew up chicken and peas because later the mouth cells are going to get back in the form of glucose or ATP or whatever biological thing they get. I don't really know. Uh, they're going to get that back in a form that's more digestible to them. And so they don't begrudge their work. They know they're part of a system that is greater than, than the individual parts, that they're part of a corporate body, literally the, the, the corpus, the body. Moreover, the labor of the mouth is accompanied with such pleasure and content as far exceeds the pains it takes. So it is in all the labor of love among Christians. The party loving reaps love again, as was showed before, which the soul covets more than all the wealth in the world. Totally contrary to the libertarian or the, the, the liberal anthropology, where we're, you know, we're all just actors or agents in this system of competing forces, and we're all just rationally, right, quote unquote, rationally trying to take as many resources as possible because we're all just just selfish beings that need to accumulate and accumulate until we die. That's rationalist economics. That's that's uh, free market e economics. That's that's the theories of von Mises and so on and so forth. That's not the economic theory of Winthrop. Winthrop is saying actually the commodity that we should all be in search for uh, we who are regenerate, we who are in Christ is love because love itself is worth more than all the treasure in the world. An ounce of pure Christian love, or the uncreated grace of God, as is manifested, and the love Christians can show each other at their best, is worth more than all the riches in the world. And so we need to construct an economic system 
which is on the basis of love, in which the more you give away, the more you receive, in which no one part of the body, regardless of how difficult their duty, regardless of how poor they are, begrudges their duty, because they understand that the diversity of the parts, the differences in meanness and wealth and skill and so on and so forth, are for the glory of God, and that if they fulfill their part or their role aptly, that they will reap love back in return, just as the mouth uh, receives the ATP or the glucose. Nicholas Gomez Davila actually said something to this effect that, that has always been interesting to me, which is, is that in life there are no secondary parts. There are only secondary actors. In other words, you, you don't get a bit part in life. Everyone in life has a role that is equally significant, whether it's a king or a beggar. All that matters is how well you play the role you're given. And this is Winthrop's understanding of life. It's not for you to accumulate, uh, to rise through the social ladder, so on and so forth. No, stay in your place, fulfill your obligation. No talk of rights, no talk of individuality, human rights, so on and so forth. Fulfill your obligation, fulfill your duty, and you will reap love. And we will have an, ec an economy and a political structure based on love. Now, he's going to complete this system and give its application or its practical end for the voyagers on the Arbella in the final section, which is, of course, following the, the generic schema, the application. Now that we have the doctrine, now that we've went through all the questions and answers and we understand and all our objections have been answered, how do we apply this to our everyday lives? Which for Winthrop is not everyday life, is, is going to be a very arduous journey in the process of colonization, which is not at all easy. What does he say? It rests now to make some application of this discourse by the present design, which gave the occasion of writing it. Herein are four things to be propounded. First, the persons. Secondly, the work. Thirdly, the end. And fourthly, the means. First, for the persons. We, the Puritans headed to Massachusetts Bay on the Arbella, are a company professing ourselves fellow members in Christ, in which respect only, though we were absent from each other many miles and had our employments as far distant, yet we ought to account ourselves knit together by this bond of love and live in the exercise of it if we would have comfort of our being in Christ. In other words, he's saying we're gathered from all parts of England. Many of us don't know each other, but we all profess the Puritan ecclesiology and theology. Therefore, don't account yourself different as one another. You are all one in Christ, and we must conceive of our political system as having some relationship to this. This was notorious in the practices of the Christians of former times, as is testified in the Waldensians, from the mouth of one of the adversaries of Aeneas Silvius. They used to love any of their own religion even before they were acquainted them. So it goes back to these ancient uh, medieval, rather heretical sects, uh, which many Protestants see themselves as being... Uh, what would you say, would see as being their ancestors. And so he looks to the Waldensians and says, well, look, the ancient Waldensians, they would account any other Waldensian before they even met them as, as being uh, of their own flesh and blood. He's saying here, same thing. We may not have grown up next to each other. We're from all over different parts of the world. But if we have unity in Christ, then this is sufficient to have political unity and for us to establish this system of mutual lending and giving and receiving. Secondly, for the work that we have in hand, it is by mutual consent through a special overvaluing providence and a more than ordinary approbation of the churches of Christ to seek out a place of cohabitation and concertship under a due form of government, both civil and ecclesiastical. In such cases as this, the care of the public must oversway all private respects. Repeat that again. In such cases as this, the care of the public must oversway all private respects by which not only conscience, but mere civil policy doth bind us. For it is a true rule that particular estates cannot subsist in the ruin of the public. If only Americans understood this. Uh, for it is a true rule that particular estates cannot subsist in the ruin of the public. You don't get to exercise your rights to the detriment of the common good in the body politic. You don't get to be the liver that decides, uh, you know, I'm just going to grow indefinitely. That's cancer. In fact, Edward Abbey actually makes this point. Uh, growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of the cancer cell. We don't want the ideology of the cancer cell in our, in our body politic. He's saying in order to be healthy, we have to uh, rein in these passions and desires and that our private desires must be put to the measure of the common good. Thirdly, the end is to improve our lives to do more service to the Lord, the comfort and increase of the body of Christ, whereof we are members, that ourselves and posterity may be the better preserved from the common corruptions of this evil world, to serve the Lord and work out our salvation under the power and purity of his holy ordinances. Why are we forming this union? It's not for religious freedom. Uh, all of the Puritans were against religious freedom. Uh, we'll get into that in a separate lecture. Uh, they were famously intolerant. 
as quite frankly were almost all people in the 17th century, except maybe Quakers and a couple other radical sects. Intolerance was the norm. The Puritans were intolerant. Error has no rights. Uh, the Puritans firmly agree with this sentiment. But what they're saying is, what is the goal of our society? What is the goal of the political? Why do we give up our individual, quote unquote, rights, really our, our, our private desires to the body politic? It's not for increased safety. It's not for increased happiness and general well-being. It's so that we may work out our salvation in fear and trembling. All political activity must be subordinate to one goal, which is to bring us to the kingdom of God. And of course, when you evaluate modern political systems by that standard, you see how hollow the 20th century really is. Oh, liberalism has allowed you to have a bigger TV. Oh, the free market has, has given you, uh, which it hasn't, it's an illusion, has given you more, more freedoms and more rights and so on and so forth. Well, okay, but has the free market enabled you to be saved? Has it enabled you to be a Christian, to live a Christian life in fear and trembling? Has it enabled you to raise a family in a healthy Christian environment and to bring your children into the kingdom of God? Where were you more likely for you and your family to be saved? Uh, as a serf in medieval Serbia in the 13th century? Uh, or, or in contemporary modern-day America uh, as a member of a middle management class making $120,000 a year? Well, very obviously, I would take being the serf because if your priorities are aligned correctly, if you really do want salvation, a political system which is ordained toward your salvation it doesn't matter how lowly you are. You're happy to be the mouth chewing away on the peas and the chicken. You're happy to be the serf because what matters is that this system, everyone makes sacrifices for the sake of the greater good. The greater good conceived not in temporal worldly terms, but in terms of salvation, which is what he's saying. The whole point of the Maple Hour Compact of uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony is for us to work out our salvation is for us to live out the holy ordinances of the Lord Jesus Christ. Fourthly, for the means whereby this must be effected. In other words, how do we actually carry out the creation of this godly society? They are twofold, a conformity with the work and an end we aim at. Thus, these we see are extraordinary. Therefore, we must not content ourselves with the usual ordinary means. Again, he's repeating himself a bit here. He's saying we're in extraordinary circumstances. Do not content yourself with the ordinary. It's John Winthrop's continual gesture in the sermon. Go beyond, go beyond, go beyond. Whatever you think you can do, you're going to have to do more. Whatsoever we did or ought to have done when we lived in England, the same must we do and more also where we go. That which the most in their churches maintain as truth and profession only, we must bring into familiar and constant practice, not just professing, but living. As in this duty of love, we must love brotherly without dissimulation. We must love one another with a pure heart fervently. We must bear one another's burdens. We must not look only on our own things, but also on the things of our brethren. Again, collective, collective, collective. Winthrop really is an American forefather that opposes this American tradition of individualism. It's always about the collective, the corporate body. Thus stands the case between God and us. We are entered into covenant with him for this work, for the project of Massachusetts Bay. We have taken out a commission. The Lord hath given us leave to draw our own articles. Now, I mean, here you can see the sort of silliness of Puritanism and, and, and the way in which it's going to fail and, and, and fail on a rather epic scale. The idea here is this sort of Calvinist covenant theology by which the Puritans see themselves as a sort of chosen people, as a new Israel, going to create their shining Jerusalem in the wilderness. And they created a covenant or a contract with God, and the Lord have given them leave to draw their own articles. Meaning, they created a contract with God. The contract could say whatever they wanted it to, and God would ratify it. It's a bit odd, but they do believe that they've created this contract, by which if they live a holy life, God will materially reward them. Not individually, but will allow them collectively as a society to prosper. And if they backslide, if they are evil, if they are wicked and perverse and give themselves up to the reprobate mind, well, then God will take away uh, their material benefits. Now, of course, this is ridiculous, right? Of Israel, this is true. But, but in the New Covenant, this is not at all true. There are many virtuous, holy Christian societies that have not attained great wealth. And there are many evil, perverse societies that have obtained extraordinary amounts of wealth. Same with individuals. Just look at the book of Job. 
But Winthrop here, operating on some of these Puritan errors and delusions that we'll get into in later lectures, really does believe that God will reward them for being good and holy. We have professed to enterprise these and those accounts upon these and those ends. We have hereupon besought him a favor and blessing. He goes on to explain what I've just said. Now, if the Lord shall please to hear us and bring us in peace to the place we desire, then he hath ratified this covenant and sealed our commission, and will expect a strict performance of the articles contained in it. If we land safe in Massachusetts Bay, it's a sign the contract has been ratified, meaning that we now have to live holy lives so that we may be materially blessed. But if we shall neglect the observation of these articles, which are the ends we have propounded, and dissembling with our God shall fall to embrace this present world and prosecute our carnal intentions, seeking great things for ourselves and our posterity, and at the expense of the common good, the Lord will surely break out in wrath against us and be revenged of such a people and make us know the price of our breach of covenant. In other words, obey God or be wiped off the face of the earth. Meekly obey the commands of the Lord and you shall prosper. This is the American idea, and of course this is erroneous, and this gives birth to any number of strange American ways of thinking, because this ethic, 150 years later, is going to be secularized. Benjamin Franklin is going to take what Winthrop applied to the collective and apply it to the individual, and take what Winthrop applied in a religious sense and apply it in a purely worldly sense. So we go from Winthrop's, if we are holy, we shall prosper, uh, if you are elect, if you are holy, you prosper, to Benjamin Franklin's, uh, if you are elect, you are wealthy, therefore you are a good person. Right, purely individual and purely on the basis of individual merits. Benjamin Franklin's idea is that if you're a good person, you have a lot of money. People who are thrifty, people who are frugal, people who are clever, they become rich. And people who are stupid, ignorant, vicious, addicted to any number of evil things will always be poor. This becomes the Franklin way of looking at things the way many Americans still look at things. If you're poor, it's your fault. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps, so on and so forth. And this, this degenerates even further into things like the prosperity gospel and, and other things that I don't want to talk about because this is already a bit too long as it is. Okay, last two paragraphs. The Lord will be our God and delight to dwell among us as his own people and will command a blessing upon us in all our ways so that we shall see much more of his wisdom, power, goodness, and truth than formerly we have been acquainted with. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us when ten of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies, when he shall make us a praise and glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, may the Lord make it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be, famous words, as a city upon a hill, the eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. We shall open the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the ways of God and all professors for God's sake. We shall shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us till we be consumed out of the good land whither we are going. Because again, the Puritans really think they are God's chosen people. They're going to the new world to make a new Jerusalem. They're hoping that the Puritan experiment succeeds and becomes incredibly wealthy and powerful so that all these retrograde peoples back in old Europe, uh, the Anglicans and the Catholics and the Orthodox, will look back at the Puritans and say, wow, they figured it out. God must be blessing them because they're holy. Uh, we should repent and uh, embrace Puritan theology and ecclesiology. This is what Winthrop really thinks is going to happen. Now, of course, America is a backwater. It seems utterly delusional that he's saying that this tiny, tiny backwater of, quite frankly, a tiny, tiny backwater island like, like England, which really is not a big player in European affairs at this moment in time, is, is now going to be the center of salvation history. But this is what Winthrop believes. And to shut this discourse with the exhortation of Moses, that faithful servant of the Lord, in his last farewell to Israel, Deuteronomy 30, Beloved, there is now set before us life and death, good and evil, and that we are commanded this day to love the Lord our God and to love one another, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his ordinance and his laws and the articles of our covenant with him, that we may live and be multiplied and that the Lord our God may bless us in the land whither we go to possess it. But if our hearts shall turn away, so that we will not obey, but shall be seduced and worship other gods, our pleasures and profits, and serve them, it is propounded unto us this day we shall surely perish out of the good land whither we pass over this vast sea to possess it. Therefore let us choose life, that we, we and our seed may live by obeying his voice and cleaving to him, for he is our life and our prosperity. Our life and our 
prosperity, both things in the Lord and in this economics of love which Winthrop has propounded. I want to conclude with one last sentiment from the great Americanist Perry Miller about the conclusion of this sermon and its significance, again, to a larger reimagination of American history that I'm hoping this channel can, can start to be a part of. Profound though he was, Winthrop probably did not entirely realize how novel, how radical was his sermon. He assumed he was merely theorizing about this projected community in relation to the Calvinist divinity absolute sovereign of the universe. What in reality he was telling the Proto-Americans was that they could not just blunder along like ordinary people, seeking wealth and opportunity for their children. Every citizen of this new society would have to know, completely understand, and reckon every day with the enunciated terms on which it was brought into being, according to which it would either survive or perish. The duty of conscious realization lay as heavy upon the humblest, the least educated, the most stupid, as upon the highest, the most learned, and the cleverest.